Without these experiments, the 2D spin would be a mathematical curiosity and nothing more. But does it all agree with the experimental data? Well, it describes the correlation that leads to the violation of Bell's inequalities without entanglement. It agrees with the results of the stern gerlach experiment. When passed through a magnetic field, a spin splits into two states. It restores locality to nature, and it gives a basis for explaining the anomalies in EPR experiments. It restores determinism and causality to nature. Indeed, he does not have to roll dice. Let's go and look at the magnetic moment of an electron. It is given in terms of the electron G factor, which is accurately known to 11 significant figures, and the Bohr magneton. It is also given in terms of the spin one-half operator S, which is also given in terms of the Pauli spin vector sigma. Therefore, up to a constant, the magnetic moment is a quantum mechanical operator being proportional to the Pauli spin vectors. Back to our two-dimensional spin, we assume that the magnetic moments are represented by these two Pauli spin matrices. So let us write it like this where the magnetic moments are replaced by two components of the Pauli spin matrix. These operators are attributes of the system which describe the state. So what are all possible operators for spin one-half? We always have the identity and the three components of the Pauli spin vector. Are there more? No. Because any other product of the observables can always be written in terms of only one because of the commutation relations. Looking at all such contributions of observables is like saying that the attributes of a system are determined by its algebra of observables. What this means for a spin one-half is that only these four operators and no others are needed to fully describe a spin. But in what combination? If you think about it, the only macroscopic property from spin one-half is when they align in the magnetic field, giving a paramagnetic polarization in the direction P. Hence, the spin one-half density operator given here. Note that before I used lower cases for x, y, z for the spin microframe. Here I am in the laboratory frame and using uppercase x, y, z. The system containing a statistically number of spins can give rise to a net macroscopic polarization. Its magnitude is proportional to p measured in the laboratory frame. The microframe and the laboratory frame are related by a simple rotation. When p equals 1, it means that all the spins in the system are lined up in the direction p. When p is less than 1, not all the spins are lined up. And when p equals 0, the spins are randomly oriented and have no net polarization. This is a statistical treatment, and the spin density operator gives the state of an ensemble of spin 1 half. But what if the spins are polarized along the z-axis? So pz is not zero, but px and py are both zero. Note that there is no error associated with the z-component. It is a pure state. But complete dispersion, which means no knowledge, for the other two components. This is a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which states that if a spin is polarized along one direction, say z, then it cannot be polarized in any other direction. The system is in a pure state defined by the z-axis. This gives us the usual spin picture from quantum mechanics. Each spin is a point particle with a permanent magnetic moment pointing in one direction. As I mentioned several times, I have no difficulty with this model except when the field is removed and the spins cannot couple to it nor align it. Actually, this is a good place to stop. It is now time to discuss the stern gerlach experiment with the goal of showing that quantum mechanics is a statistical theory about measurement and spin polarization is a result of the net number of spins pointing up or down.